in here, is he? Jeremiah 25, 30 reads, The Lord will roar from on high. He will thunder from his holy dwelling and roar mightily against his land. He will shout like those who tread the grapes, shout against all who live on the earth. The tumult will resound to the ends of the earth, for the Lord will bring charges against the nations. He will bring judgment on all mankind and put the wicked to the sword, declares the Lord. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. going to accomplish his will and if you and if we want our country taken uh well we just we just need to get on god's side our our country will be uh blessed by that barb's gonna uh she's gonna do a reading on uh, uh america the beautiful the story behind the song america the beautiful during the summer of 1893 a teacher named katherine lee bates encountered a sight she would never forget. As she told it, one day some of the other teachers and I decided to go on a trip to the 14,000 foot Pikes Peak. We hired a prairie wagon and near the top we had to leave the wagon and go the rest of the way on mules. I was very tired, 
But when I saw the view, I felt great joy. All the wonders of America seemed displayed there with the sea-like expanse. America has, Americans have been singing about that view ever since. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, for purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. America, America, God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. Pikes Peak is located in central Colorado, rising as it does along the spine of the Rocky Mountains. The view from the mountain's summit inspired Bates to write a poem in tribute, which she promptly did upon returning to her hotel. But it wasn't a mountain alone that motivated Bates. Her experience on Pikes Peak was actually the pinnacle of a long journey through the heartland of America, a journey that took her from the world in Chicago thine alabaster cities gleam, and through the wheat fields of Kansas, and th for amber waves of grain, to the top of Pikes Peak, for purple mountains majesties. It was a journey that prompted one of the most beloved songs ever penned, America the Beautiful. And when you think about it, the, America, the United States of America is a unique country in many ways. For one thing, the na our nation is vast, extending from the Atlantic in the east to the Pacific in the west, or as Bayes put it, from sea to shining sea. As a result, there are few countries on earth that contain as much diverse beauty as ours does, from the purple mountains of the Rockies to the amber waves of grain on the Great Plains, the magnificent desert canyons of the southwest to the tall, broad forests of the Northeast. From warm, wet Everglades in the deepest South to the lush rainforests of the Pacific Northwest, you could travel for hundreds and hundreds of miles, exploring hundreds and hundreds of different regions with all their different climates and cultures, and still find yourself under the same spacious sky. So perhaps that's why I love America the Beautiful so much, because it captures something I love about America itself. Whoever you are, wherever you go, there's always something beautiful to see, and there's always something to love. Two years after writing America the Beautiful, Bates published it in the Congregationalist, calling it America, a poem for July 4th. It didn't take long for the words to catch on. By the time Bates released a new version in 1911, it had been set to music. Samuel Ward's familiar turn, tune, Materna, and it became, if not the national anthem, an anthem for Independence Day. I think many Americans like the song because it expresses what they themselves feel every 4th of July, because it describes many of the things we as Americans have to be thankful for our freedom and liberty, for example. Oh, beautiful for pilgrim feet, whose stern and passion stress, a thoroughfare for freedom beat, or the sacrifice so many men and women have shown while defending our country. Oh, beautiful for heroes proved in liberating strife. Fortunately for Bates, she lived to see her poem become a national treasure, Fortunately for the rest of us, she never sought to profit off people's patriotism. While she did hold the copyright, she never charged royalties from any publication or performance of the piece. As Bates saw it, the hold, on it, has, the hold it has upon our people is clearly due to the fact that Americans are, at heart, idealists with a fundamental faith in human brotherhood. This Independence Day, you probably heard America the Beautiful played at some point, perhaps while listening to the fireworks or while watching the, a parade. But when, whenever you hear it, I encourage you to sing along, and I encourage you to reflect on what you find most beautiful about America. It's easy sometimes to get caught up in all the things that divide Americans, but the most, I'm sorry, but the more we focus on the things that unite us, the more we focus on the things we all love and cherish, the more we focus on the same spacious sky that covers all our heads, the more we can fulfill the song's ultimate promise and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. 
I'm so happy to live in this nation of ours. For all of its problems, for all of its challenges, it's still America, home of the free and the brave. It's still America, sweet land of liberty. It's still America, the beautiful. Amen. You know, uh, when it talks about amber rays, waves of grain, did anybody ever combine wheat? I combined wheat as a kid. I loved it. But I didn't like plowing the stubble, half mile rows with a three bottom plow and a John Deere and an umbrella. But, <laughs> but when I think of amber waves of grain, I just love wheat fields for some reason. I just, I love to see them. I love to combine it. Uh, that was a great childhood, I tell you. Let's sing out. <laughs> Before we continue on uh, to worship in song, we just wanted to uh, update you a little bit about what's been going on here at Lex Christian, um, and also a little bit of what is to come. So uh, I don't know if any of you passed through the church halls uh, this past week at, uh, at any point, but if you did, you might have seen this scene in our kitchen. Um, there we go. Now, you may be wondering, what is that? No, those aren't boxes of donuts or muffins, sorry. Um, those are actually gift boxes and backpacks that uh, Royal Family Kids Camp assembled here to take to the campers who unfortunately weren't able to have camp this summer due to coronavirus. And 
I know uh, there are some of you here in our church that help in that ministry, and I just wanted to say thank you. But um, I wanted to point that out uh, to let you know that there is still ministry going on, even though um, we've had to do it different lately. Um, we've had to adapt, we've had to adjust, and um, you know, I think it's an exciting place to be uh, when we have to lean and depend on God uh, to show us how we could still minister to people and meet their needs, despite the fact that we couldn't even have camp this year. Uh, also this last week here, our uh, Tag Student Ministries, we had uh, our summer party uh, down in Elwood, um, and we met at our house here and uh, had s'mores and had a good old time. Um, I wanted to show a few of those pictures here uh, just to show you some of our smiling faces. And yes, they do still exist um, out there. Um, and also to highlight that here starting in August, our student ministries will be picking back up. We haven't set firm dates um, on that, but our schools have set the dates in which they're going to meet. Um, and so I just wanted to update you to keep an eye out on the website, um, keep coming back to church, and we'll let you know when our Wednesday night activities will resume. But also, would you be, please be praying for our volunteers and our leaders and our students? Um, you know, we've been off for a long time here, and um, we definitely have a ways to go to get the ball moving again. So finally, I just wanted to let you guys know as well. Um, if you live in Elwood or like the drive down to Elwood, starting on Thursday, August 6th, uh, there's going to be a community Bible study down in Elwood. It's going to meet at the Thrivent office. You'll recognize that scene driving in on the highway if uh, you're not familiar. But if you are from down in that area and you would like to come together, it's people from different churches, people that live in Elwood. And come to church here in Lex and people that go to church in Elwood. Um, just wanted to make that available for you. It's kind of just an experiment to see uh, what we can get going on. So those are just a few of our announcements. If you have anything you would like uh, to be announced at church next Sunday or to be up on the website, just let us know in the office. So let's take this time now. We're going to continue to worship in song. Uh, invite our worship team back up. Would you please stand and join us? Zechariah 13, 1. On that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and impurity. Beneath the flood, lose all their guilt and stay. 
we do come before you we just uh we praise you and thank you that you did shed your blood father that that's the only way that we can claim righteousness and uh father we just thank you that you you loved us so much that you sent your son and uh father as we sing these songs man it brings back memories and uh and i just thank you for the foundation that our founding fathers left our nation and uh how that's just carried down through the years and our country has been blessed beyond all measure. And uh, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you and we praise you and we just look forward to what you're going to accomplish in the years ahead. And we just ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. All right. Thank you for being here this morning. As many of you know, but maybe not all of you, I'm not Daniel Sauer. I'm the youth pastor here, so uh, keep that in mind when I use modern vernacular and slang that you're not familiar with. I try to keep up with the trends. I could see Shaylee rolling her eyes, though. I, I'm woefully behind uh, what is cool and hip and with it. At one time, I felt like I was cool and with it, but... But what it 
was has now changed and it now isn't, and so I'm no longer with it. But all that aside, last Sunday, if you were here, uh, I talked about my consternation with my slow Amazon shipping speeds during the pandemic. Um, but I also did concede that much of what I order off of Amazon, I can live without. You know, I could probably get by. Um, one of those purchases I made from Amazon a little bit over a year ago was one of those DNA ancestry kits uh, from 23andMe. Uh, has anyone here ever done one of those? Know what, know what I'm talking about? Well, for those of you who don't know what it is, um, they'll mail you a tube and uh, for no other way to put it, you spit in the tube and you send your saliva back uh, to this company um, and they will trace the DNA and, and you can get a sense of your ancestry. And yes, I know I'm in a government database now, but um, I found out some stuff that I already knew. Uh, for instance, uh, English, Irish on my dad's side and French, German on my mom's side. Um, but I also found out something I didn't know, that I'm 4% Ashkenazi Jew, um, which was a surprise to me. had no idea that I had uh, that heritage. Um, I told my wife I want to get like a little tiny slice of a yarmulke, like 4% of one. I am wear it around, show off my heritage. Um, all kidding aside, though, uh, this new information that I obtained about my heritage, uh, where I came from, really hasn't changed the way that I live my life. Um, it was just interesting to me um, because, uh, for those of you who know me, I'm a history buff, and I, I'm interested in how people lived before our modern age. And, and looking into the past like that was more just a, a pursuit of curiosity um, to help give me a better connection to the past. But you know, there were limits to the test. The test could tell me that I'm probably a descendant of King Charlemagne, and if you have any European heritage, you probably are too. Fathered a lot of children. Um, and, but the test, it couldn't tell me what my ultimate origin was. There were limits. It, it could only go back so far. In other words, there was no origin story. If I wanted to trace my family tree back to the beginning, I need to go somewhere else. And I think, as we all know, that somewhere else is the Bible. When the Apostle Paul was dialoguing with the philosophers at Mars Hill, he dropped this truth bomb on them. That's one of those modern slangs, truth bomb, all right? Paul said to them, he said, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all of the face of the earth, having determined the allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. So if I were to trace my genealogy back as far as it could possibly go, I would end up with two naked great-grandparents, a thousand time removed, who live somewhere near the Tigris and Euphrates rivers and who are commanded to be fruitful and multiply. And uh, I would say that with approximately 7.8 billion people alive in the world today, that they fulfilled that command, wouldn't you say? I think they did a good job. And think about that number, though, 7.8 billion. That's a lot of mouths to feed. That's a lot of shelters to build. That's a lot of clothing to manufacture. And that's a whole lot of people who need Jesus. Represented in that 7.8 billion people of every, are people of every tribe, tongue, and nation. People who, according to the most current report I could find, speak over 6,500 different languages. Now, do you suppose with all of those people and all of those different languages that misunderstandings creep up from time to time? Of course. I mean, misunderstandings arise even amongst those of us who speak the same language. And do you also suppose that out of those 7.8 billion people alive today that some of them have a skewed outlook on the world and believe things that are flat out wrong or misguided at best? Nod your heads, yes, of course. I mean, it's obvious it's the human condition. Now, as those who have been entrusted with the truth, we have had the eyes of our hearts and minds open to the reality of who God is. 
And we are called to be ambassadors in this world that's overflowing with different people, different beliefs, and different languages. And that mission begins at home. And if we look at our nation at this current point in time, it's unfortunately a nation that's divided. And, you know, while I don't think that things are often as bad as the media pretends them to be, um, I do believe that it's obvious that there are many people, particularly young people, who are searching and who are being led by some of the worst aspirations and ideologies you could imagine. Now, the point of today's sermon um, of running the race, is what I titled it, isn't to castigate others or trash their beliefs, because as Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 6, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So remind yourselves of this verse the next time you're confronted with an image on the news or on Facebook of some mass teenagers rioting in the streets. Our struggle isn't ultimately with them, but with the forces that govern them. Simply put, if you're not a child of the king, you're a child of the prince of the power of the air, who is Satan. And how would you imagine Satan's kids would behave? Think daycare from hell being let loose out on the streets, and you kind of got a picture of what seems to be going on uh, in the world. And you know what? It, it kind of comes with the territory. Unbelievers are going to act and behave as unbelievers do. And at this time in our history, they're especially rowdy. And try as we might, we can't control them. We can really only control ourselves. So what I want to do today for us here is to lay bare some of the traps that are out there that keep us as believers from fulfilling the Great Commission We've been giving a char- given a charge and a duty as believers, no matter the time, no matter the place, no matter the state of our affairs in Nebraska or in the country. Um, and we need to be the ambassadors that we're called to. So we want to be sure to be good ambassadors. And that's what today's message is about. You know, if you turn on the news or log into Facebook, you see a picture of that great divide I spoke of a little bit ago. Republican versus Democrat, liberal versus conservative, young versus old, Catholic versus Protestant, pro-life versus pro-choice, gay versus straight, black versus white. It seems that there's this urge, no matter the issue, for people to take sides. You want to put on your team's uniform and wage war against your perceived enemy. And yes, while there are important social and political issues that we should certainly be involved in as believers, They should never take the place of our true calling to make Christ known. And today we're going to look at how we can effectively run the race uh, of life as believers in this topsy-turvy, set-on-edge world of ours. And in this context and in this climate today, to do that, we must avoid an us-versus-them mentality. Now I'm going to state up front that I'm no sociologist or political scientist. What I've been charged to do personally is to preach the word. And the amazing thing about the word of God is that there is very little of the human condition that it doesn't speak to, it doesn't, that it doesn't hit upon. You know, humans have been remarkably the same ever since the beginning. And insofar as the lessons that we learn from scripture and the commands that God gives us speak to current events, then we're in good shape. And I believe that they do. So, um, at the heart of any ill will towards other people, this us versus them mentality, no matter who they are, is a basic ignorance of the fact that every person, no matter their shape, size, or shade, is a unique reflection of God. Every person possesses the imago Dei, the image of God, and every attribute of a person is God-ordained. God doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't make any one person superior to any other person. And for us, for people in general, to sit in judgment of anyone for something they have no control over is, in effect, us telling God that he made a mistake, that he didn't do it right, and, you know, God, you messed up on that one. 
To judge someone based on their appearance is ultimately the height of arrogance. It's to take a prerogative that not even God takes. For as he told Samuel when he was selecting David, the king of Israel, do not look at his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. This is actually David's brother. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And that's something that we need a lot of, especially um, in our social media-driven world where image is everything. We need to remember that it's God who looks that into our hearts and he sees us for who we are. And, and I think when we recapture a sense of that as believers of seeing a person for their whole being, for their soul, that um, we can get past some of that superficiality. Um, if you would, and you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 10. Uh, it's a passage that I know we're all familiar with, most of us anyways. Um, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we're going to read this parable this morning, and, and we're going to see that some of the tension that exists between different people groups that us versus them existed even back in Bible times. It says that a lawyer stood up and put Jesus to the test saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest who was going down that road when he saw him passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He's, the lawyer replied, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And you know, with parables, Jesus has a way of choosing the exact right words that are pregnant with meaning. And it's no coincidence in this story that Jesus chose a Samaritan to be the hero of this story. Because as many of you know, the Jews and the Samaritans flat out didn't like each other. The Samaritans, they were descendants of the northern Israel tribes um, and, uh, who had intermarried with pagan peoples when the northern tribes were carried off into Assyrian captivity. You know, they retained some of their beliefs about God, but those beliefs were tainted by the false teachings of the time. The Jews, on the other hand, of which you now know I'm 4% one of, were God's chosen people who didn't devolve into idolatry, or so they thought, but who had the full revelation of God in the law and prophets to guide them. They had God's special revelation to inform their lives, yet they hated their neighbors. They despised the Samaritans as wayward brothers and sisters and considered them to be lower than dogs. And they pattern their lives in such a way as to avoid them at all costs. They did not want to come into contact with Samaritans. You all probably remember the story from John chapter 4. We can go there next here in our Bibles. In John chapter 4, Jesus is really getting the ball rolling on his ministry. 
And there comes a certain point in time where he's going to pick up and start to travel. Let me get there as well. Now, in this situation, we find that Jesus, he was on his way to Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. That's what the scripture here says. Which may seem unremarkable at first, but at the time, any Jew who was traveling and had to pass the territory of Samaria would take the long way around and would cross the Jordan River and take the Transjordanian Highway instead of taking the quickest route. So when it says that Jesus had to pass through Samaria in John 4, I believe it's because of this divine appointment he had to keep. So starting in verse 1, it says, <clears throat> Now when Jesus had learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria, so when he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph, Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. Now notice here, according to John, that it was the Jews who had no dealings with the Samaritans. Not the other way around. It wasn't the Samaritans refusing to deal with the Jews, but God's chosen people had cut the Samaritans completely out of their lives. Now you might expect that these people who had gone wayward, who embraced idolatry, who didn't have the full special revelation of God, might, you know, be at odds with their neighbors. But you wouldn't think that it would be God's chosen people who had that ana an animosity. You would think that they would be, you know, loving and have a sense of outreach towards them. But instead... They had this animosity that kept them. It was this bitterness that they had built up, and they just refused to deal with them. And something definitely wasn't right with that picture. And you know, for us as Christians, we can't simply get comfortable in the culture and avoid people, places, and things simply because that's just the way we do things. We, we don't want to settle into a pattern of life that is comfortable and doesn't take risk for the sake of the gospel. You know, Jesus didn't let anyone else's preconceived notions of who the Samaritans were stop him from personally impacting this woman's life and in turn the lives of most of the people of this village here. And you know, at the time, Jesus, he wasn't a trendsetter. trendsetter. He bucked any and all trends that anyone held dear that weren't of God. And we should do the same. We should let no picture painted of someone else cloud how we view them as a person created in the image of God who needs, above all else, a restored relationship with him. And if we, like Jesus, when he meets the woman at the well here in John 4, can be the impetus for bringing God and that lost soul together, then we have to seize that opportunity. And so the second point I would like for us to focus on today in order to run the race well, is to avoid being off-putting. You know, Jesus came from the Father full of grace and truth. And when he had to be brutally honest, he would. But also, when he needed to be tender, he would do that as well. And in the scripture, we don't ever read of Jesus encountering a penitent sinner and, you know, calling that person a viper. Rather, he was tender with them. He was patient and he based his interaction with them based on the other person's need. You know, in John chapter 8, when a woman is caught in uh, adultery, and she's dragged before Jesus, and the teachers of the law are just loudly shouting at him, you know, we're, we need to stone her, we need to stone her. That's what the law of God says. It was Jesus who said, he who is without sin among you, let him, let him be the first one to throw a stone. 
He knew how to respond in the moment because he had a sustained relationship with the Father, and, and his reactions didn't ebb and flow with the severity of the encounter with the other person. You know, we've all heard the expression that the truth hurts, and, and who out of the 7.8 billion people alive in the world today have the truth? We do, right? We possess the truth in God's word and in our relationship with Christ. And what are we to do with that truth? We're to share it. We're to take it into all of the world. And, you know, if the truth in and of itself hurts, if the cross, as it says in Galatians 5.11, is an offense to sinners, then we must guard against piling on. You know, the gospel in and of itself is offensive to sinners. People don't like to hear that they've fallen short of God's glory. And we don't need to, you know put our fingers in their eyes and, you know, make it hurt worse by piling on. It's just something that we need to be on guard for, you know. God's word will show a sinner the error of their ways, not some clever meme. We as those who know what is right and true must never wield that knowledge in an effort to win arguments or petty squabbles at the expense of losing the person. We must be, as Jesus commanded us, salt and light, and we must stand on the truth and never waver. But we communicate that truth in a way as to win over a brother and a sister. As it says in Colossians 4, chapter 4 verse 6, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. You know, I'll be the first to admit that it takes a lot of personal strength and resolve for me to not blurt out the obvious, and I think my wife would attest to that uh, when I let my guard down, I can be pretty snarky, especially towards bad drivers. Um, but we, as Christians, are never to respond in kind. We are to turn our cheeks when struck. We are to offer our coats when someone demands our shirt. We are to go two miles with a person when they demand we go one. Confrontations for us as Christians offer us the chance to demonstrate grace in a tangible way and to tell the truth in a way that avoids additional offense. You know, I'm, I'm not oblivious to what's going on in the world, and I'm sure neither are you out here. Um, and it does take a lot of personal strength and resolve to maintain a cheerful disposition in the face of so much that looks so dour and so downcast and I'm right there with you um, I really have to uh, limit the amount of information I'm letting in from outside sources and really increase the amount of information I'm getting from this source in order to maintain an even keel it seems you know um, but I do believe that we can still find joy even in our circumstances and and I watched this video here. I have a video for us to watch that I was watching this week um, that really captures our time in America today. Um, it's about 10 minutes long, and it's from an evangelist named Ray Comfort. And I'm not promoting his ministry um, or saying he's subscribed to everything you see here. I just really thought it captured a lot of what's going on in our time. Um, and just to warn you, trigger warning, another one of those words that's popular today. The first half of the video might be a little upsetting. It does show some of the chaos in our world. But the second half of the video really has the solution for, for the ills of our society. So let, let's watch this here, um, and we'll resume. Hopefully it works. Is there a play button on that? Sorry, technical difficulties, too many irons in the fire. It, is anything showing up on that slide? Not, oh, Connor to the rescue. If ever a tech-savvy tech person existed. Um, if anything, you could go to the PowerPoint on the desktop maybe and open it up. Well, while we wait, Cue the Jeopardy music. And if we can't get it up, then I'll take that as God's providence that, you know, you didn't need the video. His word's enough.
Technology, can't live with it, can't live without it. All right, well, if it fires up here in a second, we'll, we'll roll with it. If not, no problemo. Connor, what's the verdict? Thumbs up, thumbs down. On the desktop, I'll run the race. Sounds like they're on it, doesn't it? And should we do one of those slow claps for them? No? Okay. I apologize for that. The anticipation must be building, right? Better be really good if it does come up. Otherwise, I would have definitely missed the mark. See, I planned a shorter sermon accounting for this, so I feel like I still have to fill this, you know, time up with something. Hey, with that being said, uh, we are looking for help in our sound booth, too. So uh, that's one of our slides that scrolls by every morning. I don't know if you've noticed that, but apart from the human error on my part, we've got a great setup back there. So if you'd like to learn more about that, we can just move on, guys, if you'd like. Oh, they got it. Uh -huh. I've always found Apple computers to be of the devil. You know, what did Satan tempt Eve with? The f okay. This comes after a weekend of murder and oh, there we go. All right. Thank you, Connor. We got greedy, tried to make it full screen there. It is. Remember, patience is a fruit of the Spirit. I'm only trying to grow that fruit. <laughs> there we go. Let's try that. All right. I saw some of you bringing in garden fruits. No tomato hurling, please. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Sorry about that.
no wrong with you. This is because what the state of Uganda made us in those nations and blessed us with health and prosperity. Not only have we serious racial today, but we've become a nation that's given itself to violence, to lawlessness, killing of millions of children in the womb, to adultery, fornication, homosexuality, blasphemy, and pornography. And in doing so, we've lost our blessing and become a nation that's continually plagued with sickness and incurable diseases. Something of which the Bible warns, saying that righteousness exalts a nation and that sin will bring any who serve it down to a place of shame. And I'm a good guy. You're a good person? I'm a good person. Well, why, I want you to listen to me because I'm going to share something real important with you. You think you're a good person. The Bible says there's none good, so let's see if the Bible's right or you're right. Are you ready? Can you be honest with me? Yes. How many lies have you told in your life? I told quite a few. Ever stolen something? Yes. So you're a lying thief? Yes. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Uh, yes, I have. Would you use your mother's name as a cuss word? No, 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 never. Yeah, never, because you my mother. respect her. Respect her. You haven't loved God and respected him because you've used his name as a cuss word when you use it in vain. It's called blasphemy, Juan. It's yeah, deadly growing serious. Up, growing up, yes. Yes. It's deadly serious. It's blasphemy and it's punishable by death in the Old Testament. I appreciate your patience with me and your honesty, Juan. Jesus said if you look at a woman and lust for her, you commit adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Yes. Have you had sex before marriage? Yes. So, Juan, you're not a good person. You're like the rest of us. You've just told me you're a lying, thieving, fornicating, blasphemous, adulterer at heart. And you have to face God on Judgment Day. You have looked at four of the yeah. Ten Commandments. So every, here's a... Every, he, everybody for sure. That's true. So on Judgment Day, if God judges you by the Ten Commandments, are you going to be innocent or guilty? Guilty. Heaven or hell? Who knows? Well, the Bible says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire. No thief, no blasphemer, no fornicator 
Well, and here at God's kingdom, so you're in big trouble. Can you see that? Yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah. You've got God's word on it, man. If you die in your sins, he'll damn you. I sure. have a lot of people that pray for me. Well, let's hope today is an answer to those prayers. Now, let me ask you a question. What did God do for guilty sinners so we wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you know? He died for their sins. Yeah, he suffered and died on the cross. Yeah. The Ten Commandments are called the moral law. You and I broke the law. Jesus paid the fine. That's what happened on that cross. That's why he said just before he died, it is finished. In other words, the debt has been paid. Juan, if you're in court and someone pays you fine, the judge can let you go even though you're guilty. You can say, Juan, there's a stack of speeding fines here. This is deadly serious. But someone's paid them, you're free to go. And he can let you go, he can let you walk, even though you're guilty because someone paid the fine. Well, God can let you walk on Judgment Day. He can let you legally live forever all because Jesus paid the fine in his life's blood. Can you see that? Do you understand that? Yes. God can remit your sins in an instant because of the death and resurrection of the Savior. What you have to do is repent and trust alone in him. Repentance means to turn from all sin. It means to confess and forsake your sin. You can't say, I'm a Christian, but you lie and steal and fornicate and lust and blaspheme. At the moment, you're like a man on the edge of a plane. He knows he has to jump 10,000 feet. He doesn't have a parachute on, but this is his plan. He's going to flap his arms and try and save himself. I'd say to that man, don't do that. No, trust the parachute. So don't try and save yourself on Judgment Day. It's not going to work. Don't rely on the fact you're a good person because it's not true. Instead, transfer your trust from yourself to Jesus. Trust alone in Him, not in your goodness. The moment you do that, you've got God's promise. You'll remit your sins and grant you everlasting life as a free gift. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Are you going to repent and trust in the Savior? Yes, sir. When? Today. May I pray with you? Yes, sir. Father, I pray for Juan. Thank you for his openness today and his honesty. Thank you for preserving him from death. Death could have taken him so easily, but you preserved him because you're the lover of his soul. And so today as he repents and places his faith in Jesus, may he pass from death to life because of your mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hopefully you're able to get the message of that beyond the quality there. Uh, but the world needs more of that, doesn't it? The ability to, to speak truth lovingly to a person no matter where you find them, no matter what they look like, no matter their past, no matter their present, because we know what a future in eternity apart from Christ looks like. And you know, as believers, we ought not think of ourselves more highly as we ought, which is in the scriptures. And so we must be on guard against viewing other people in that us versus them mentality. And, and I think when we keep the main thing the main thing, it's easy to approach life in a way that uh, is filled with joy instead of hanging on every latest development in the news and reacting to it. Uh, we need to be proactive as Christians, not reactive. You know, I titled today's sermon in closing, Run the Race, one, because life is a race and we should all run well, but also because so much is made of race these days. It's everywhere and there's no escaping it. But concerning race, I once heard a Bible teacher state that God doesn't care about what race you are, only that you run the race. And I would like that to be the closing theme here. And we're going to close by looking at Colossians chapter 3, because the Bible always says it better than I ever could. And, and it's one of those passages that it feels like it's the right passage for the right time. And so... Uh, if you want to find that in your Bibles or if you just want to listen, but take to heart these words from God and, and think of them in light of the chaos that exists in our world today and, and how this can be that balm of Gilead that really begins to heal our nation. It says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on earth. But you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And in these you once too walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against one another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all of these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, in closing, I, uh, when Daniel asked me to preach and he gave me today's topic, I wasn't necessarily thrilled. Um, but as I meditated and prayed this week, I felt like God has answers to the problems that we all face. And, and when we take the time to consult him in his word, I think that we can press forward as a nation, as a church, and as individuals in a way uh, that is honoring to him. So I'm going to close this time in prayer, and our ushers are going to come forward, and we're going to partake in communion. Uh, you don't have to be a member here to take communion with us. Uh, we just ask that you be a believer in Christ. Um, and when the elements come around, you'll find your bread and your drink together uh, in two separate cups, and I'm just going to ask you to hold on to those until everyone's received them, and we'll take the elements together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do come before you um, as a people who need your peace, God. Uh, we know that you are Lord over all and that you have ordained all things, and you have ordained that we exist in this time, in this place, in this nation for a certain reason and and we ask god that um, as we live our lives as we uh, pursue our ends god that we would do so in a way that brings you glory and honor and let us do so with a heart towards others and the hurts and the pains and the needs that they all have god, and we just ask for healing we ask that you would heal us god of our infirmities we ask god that you would Heal our hearts and our spirits, God, from all things such as bitterness and wrath and anger and resentment, God. We ask that you would heal our nation, God, the divisions that are sown, Lord, every day, the, the anger and the hostility, God. We know that your truth, your gospel is the only thing that can, can heal this land. And so we pray and ask, Lord, that you would begin that process now. And, and if we could be your instruments, God, in, in helping to bring that about, Lord, please do so. Lord, we need you, and nowhere is that more evident than on the cross, God. Our need for a Savior displayed on that cross, our need for someone to pay the price and the penalty for our sins, we need for someone to keep the law perfectly so that we might have a renewed relationship with you. We ask that during this time, God, as we take of the bread and the cup, that we do so remembering all that you have done for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
in the Gospel of Matthew, we read, On that last night in the upper room, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this again until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Take and drink. Father, we thank you for this reminder of your love. We thank you for this symbol of our faith, God, that shows how wholly dependent we are upon you. We thank you, Lord, that we have that amazing event to look back to on the cross, but that we also have the promise of a future spent with you. It's this hope that sustains us, God, as we press forward, as we run the race, and as we do so, Lord, in perfect fellowship with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our worship team is coming up, and they're going to close us in song. Um, I'd ask that you'd stand if you are able to, and we'll let them send us out, and just ask that you have a good and blessed week. You know, as uh, James was talking about, oh, wow, this whole message. Uh, remember Gary Nickelbein? Our, my pastor and I, we stopped over and shared Christ with him. And, uh, you know, we get to the end. I get to the end. I said, Gary, you want to pray or trust Christ? He said, oh, man, I got a lot of questions. And, I, and you know what? We can really get diverted by questions. And I, I I'm big at that. I like to argue. <laughs> but I said, Gary, why don't we just pray, trust Christ, and we'll stay and we'll answer any question you got. So we prayed and showed him in the Bible what he had done. And I said, okay, now, what questions you got? I don't have any. You see, that Christ is the answer. And uh, I need to know that and we need to know that. That Christ is the answer. Don't get caught off arguing. That's just immaterial, you know. Let's just go to Jesus. Um, all right, America the Beautiful. First verse. <laughs>